Now, as I'm talking about the CCS syndrome or the craniocervical syndrome, I've separated it into two groups. One group that involves the patients who have the neurodegenerative diseases, and those neurodegenerative diseases are multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, childhood autism, and ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. That's, that's what I'm just uh, encompassing as the, um, uh, the neurodegenerative disease group. But I'm also focusing on attention on another group that doesn't have the neurodegenerative diseases. Now, of course, one of the things you have to be, one of the things you have to be sensitive to is what is the possibility that some of these cr crani uh, uh, craniocervical syndromes will turn into one of these neuro neurodegenerative diseases some years down the road? And the reason I bring it up is that when we did the multiple sclerosis study that I'm going to be talking to you about, and we looked at eight patients, there was a time lapse between they, when they suffered the cervical trauma and when they had the onset of multiple sclerosis. And when I averaged up all eight patients, the time lapse between the trauma and the onset of symptoms was 11 years. So there's no way to really know at the outset when you experience with the patient the trauma if or when he's apt to turn into one of these neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease, like Parkinson's disease, uh, or like multiple sclerosis. So the first group then I will talk about uh, uh, just a few patients with um, uh, craniocervical syndrome, the one we've been calling CCS, uh, and then I'll follow that with patients from the neurodegenerative diseases. So if I can have the lights on that. <clears throat> now this is a patient who came to us with, it was a lady, who came to us with extreme pain um, shooting pains in the back of the neck that were intolerable. And when we scanned the patient, we found uh, dramatic pathology in the cervical spine that you can see right here. Uh, major retrolysthesis impacting uh, the, the spinal cord um, and uh, uh, displacing that spinal cord. Um, we took the patient to Dr. Rosa, and the patient had a miraculous result with Dr. Rosa a dramatic uh, relief from the symptomatology. And of course, uh, in, in addition to those retrolysis herniation, uh, displacements that you see is the marked degeneration of the cervical spines. <coughs> now this <coughs> is a second patient, and this um, patient came to us uh, with the onset of epileptic seizures. Initially, the, he had a drop attacks, and then the drop attacks ultimately turned into epileptic seizures. And when we scanned the patient, we saw this pr pronounced hydrocephalus, pronounced ventricular megaly, and the uh, cortical CSF, uh, cerebral spinal fluid, pooling phenomenon. And what, um, what we have observed in a goodly number of these patients is this is a, this is a common combo ventricular megaly together with cortical CSF pooling. When you see that pair on these patients, you have to worry about very severe increases in intracranial pressure. <clears throat> and the last patient is a, a especially interesting one to me, and I think it will be to you. Uh, this patient uh, had low back pain, and very serious low back pain, and when I interviewed the patient, the patient also had neck pain and shoulder pain. And uh, from talking with him, and I think some dizziness, from talking to him, it sounded to me that he had some, uh, uh, the, the, the signs and symptoms of this, uh, what I've been calling cranial cervical syndrome. So I said, look, come on and get a scan, okay? So we got a scan. Of course, he had a, a, a pronounced cere um, cerebellar tonsillectopia. Um, and so we took him to Dr. Rosa, and uh, Dr. Rosa treated him for a, uh, a cranial malrotation. And to my, oh, oh, oh and, and by, th by the way, in the process of show telling me his problems that he was having in the upper cervical region, he, he showed me his images in his lumbar spine. 
And you see this pronounced uh, degeneration of the disc at L5S1 and also the uh, fatty infiltration of the vertebral bodies there. Now, Dr. Rosa treated him, and to my astonishment, uh, with his treatment on the cervical spine, his back pain went away. Four feet away from what he's operating on C1 and C2, and the back pain goes away. So I, uh, um, what I came to from the understanding of this, and I think that our chiropractor colleagues know this, but us MDs don't. When I went to medical school, the vertebral column was a stack of blocks, one to, you know, to uh, the, the full length of them. And so they were just an anatomic assembly. But what is the reality here, and what this is showing you, is that the spine is a lot more than a simple anatomic stack of blocks. It's a physiological entity from top to bottom. You do something at one end, you can have a profound consequence at the other end which is something I just simply didn't know as a physician. <clears throat> now, this is another patient who had multiple sclerosis, and the patient was a very close friend of my wife. And my uh, name was Linda, and my wife said to me, um, Linda has multiple sclerosis, would you please scan her? She just wanted to be scanned, and she was deteriorating to the point that she was worried about being in a wheelchair. So after a couple of weeks of being reminded daily by my wife, we scanned her. <laughs> and then after we scanned her, my wife then started, did you look at the images yet? I said, well, I don't look at the images. I give them to our radiologist. So that went on for another two weeks. Did you look at the images yet? Did you look at the images yet? So finally, in being a dutiful husband response, I looked at the images and I was stunned. I said, look at that. There's a lesion right there and it's connected directly to the ventricular CSF. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I thought it, you know, it was some sort of artifact. Then you can see the same thing over here. So we then went ahead and did some more uh, scans on her and what we saw was a pronounced rotation, counterclockwise rotation of C2 when she was upright. And that counterclockwise uh, clockwise rotation went away when she was recovered, right here. But in addition, we saw this pronounced periventricular interstitial edema, and even the hint of, uh, even more than a hint, a pronounced evidence of leakage of the CSF into the surrounding tissue. Uh, and in, in both cases, you could see this. And what we were able to see as we started to look much more carefully at these lesions was they were almost always directly connected to the uh, ventricles, and it's something that the medical profession hadn't, hadn't fully uh, recognized. So we then went and did a study, and the next thing that I did was I looked in uh, Bill Bradley's book, and there's a chapter on multiple sclerosis. And the dominant thing on the images in the multiple sclerosis chapter was the MS lesions in their distribution. They were all periventricular. And I looked at them, I said, wait a minute, if these are just autoimmune tissue reactions, how come they're all sticking to the ventricle? And so that, that really drew our attention to the fact that um, we believe that these neurodegenerative diseases, multiple sclerosis being one example, are really consequences of uh, increased intracranial pressure, probably secondary in the main to cervical pathology that results in the linkage of the CSF. Now, this CSF, when I was an intern, is uh, not innocent stuff, even though it looks very innocent. My chief resident would say to me, debating, go ahead and get me a lumbar spine. I'd go put a needle in the lumbar spine, and I would sit there and watch until about five or 10 cc's of CSF came out into the test tube, and it looks completely innocent. It looks like water. And you, wouldn't, you, you don't take it any more seriously than it is water, but it's far cry from water. It has 300 proteins in there, and nine of those proteins are pronounced antigens. So this is not innocent stuff. So the, the, the real question is that in these patients, in, in, in Dr. Bradley's book, in multiple sclerosis, where the multiple sclerosis lesions are periventricular, how come? If they're just antigen antibody reactions, why aren't they uniformly scattered all over the cortex? But they weren't. They were clicking to the uh, 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 periventricular territory. Okay, now I'm going to show you a set of pictures because we have this technology, thanks to David Chu and 
and, <coughs> and others, um, uh, and Dr. Alperin and David Chu, and uh, what you see here on the right is the CSF sine of a uh, normal, and you see the CSF sine in, one, in the first of the, actually the, the, the patient that I just showed you that had that malrotation, that was a friend of my wife's, you can see there's pronounced obstruction of the CSF compared to what we should be seeing in the normal. And this is something we saw on virtually every MS patient, to my uh, astonishment. So that's patient number one. And you can see the pronounced interruption of CSF flow here on patient, MS patient number two. And this is MS patient number three. And not a one of these MS patients had normal CSF flow, in addition to the cervical pathology we saw with the standard imaging. Patient number four, total interruption of the dorsal CSF flow as compared with the normal. <coughs> and yet, the thing that was interesting is I, we, I didn't select any of these patients. I just did them as they came. And I couldn't believe it. There's one right after the other had exactly the same thing with direct and outright obstruction and interruption of CSF flow, cervical CSF flow. This is perhaps even the most dramatic one. There's, there's the normal showing you a full 360 degree circulation of CSF around the cord, and here on the patient, you see is only half circulation around the cord because there's dorsal obstruction of CSF flow uh, dorsal to the cord. This is patient number six. You can see there's, a, there's a, uh, an absence of the uh, CSF flow uh, eventually in, in this patient compared to the normal. And patient number seven, there's a pronounced distortion of the anatomy uh, on the dorsal canal, complete obstruction of the dorsal canal, and very much impaired flow on the ventral canal. <coughs> and the same thing here, absence of dorsal flow in patient number eight. So if <coughs> we can have the lights now. Now the last thing I'm going to show you that um, will then end it for today um, is <clears throat> what David Chu had just recently handed to me a, a day before I came here, uh, which you saw Dr. Alpern had done, and one of the things that was key, and is what Dr. Alpern was making point of, is that it depends when you measure that CSF flow. If you, if you measure the CSF or you measure the CSF pressure gradient here or here, the patient will display a normal contour. You have to be very careful about how you measure it and at what time in the cardiac cycle you measure it. So here is the velocity, is the flow velocity in cc's uh, per second, and you see there's a distinct peak almost in direct coordination with the vascular uh, uh, cycle with the cardiovascular cycle, and you see that in the in uh, the patient uh, with respect to flow velocity. <coughs> and then David did likewise. He measured the CSF pressure gradient, and he got the same coordination uh, of the CSF uh, pressure gradient as a function of the cardiac cycle. 